Welcome back, everyone, to this episode of the Superhero Ethics Podcast. I'm Matthew Westfox, one of your hosts. I am Paul Christopher Hoppy, a.k.a. Zen Madman, your other host, who's a little behind the times. <laughs> it's okay. Just it's okay. literally speaking. Well, that's good, because that means that I'm already winning. Because today, we're, oh. we are going to have a fight about fighting. <laughs> but should it be an honorable fight? Well, that's the question. T- today, we're talking about the idea of honorable combat. Um, mostly, mostly, we mean this in terms of physical fighting, but we're going to talk a little bit about um, in debates and in, in politics and other places like that. Um, this is a, an idea that I had... Somewhat inspired by the more recent um, TV show Iron Fist, but it's one that I've thought about a lot because, um, you know, in Iron Fist and like in a lot of things, there are times when people, you know, our hero says like, we have to fight this person, but we have to do it honorably. And so someone suggests a way to fight and they don't want to do that. Or they have to meet in this kind of ritual, honorable, like particular way of combat where you're fighting to the death, but only in certain ways. Um... Or in my particularly most eye-rolling version of this, our hero is fighting the villain, and his allies want to help, and our hero says, no, I, I must defeat them in single combat. Um, and, and I want to get into this, this trope, because I think it's, I think it's an interesting one, and I, I am not a martial artist by any means. I'm not someone who's ever really engaged in, in that kind of learning about combat. And I tend to have a very negative view of this trope. Um, Paul, I know you've studied martial arts for a while, and I imagine you probably have a somewhat different view. So, so I want to kind of want to kind of look at this. And, and, and so let me just start off by asking, what, what, what's your take on, on this idea of honorable combat? And, and I should say, just to be clear, I'm not talking about competition. I don't right. mean like a Taekwondo fight in an athletic sense where you're competing by rules. I, I am talking about two enemies who want each other dead, but are fighting in an honorable may, way. What's your take? Yeah, I, I, I'm not really into it. Like broadly speaking, yeah. um, th- there are certain circumstances that um, we'll get into where I, I think it can make some sense. Uh-huh. Uh, but like, if somebody's trying to kill you, and you know, in an honor, you know, unarmed fight, basically, hit them in the eyes, hit them in the throat, <laughs> hit them in the groin, hit them in the knees. If they're trying to grab you, grab a finger and break it. Right. Like the the idea of like, oh, but that's a dishonorable strike. You know, it's like, what? You know, it's uh, a great example of it, um, of honorable fighting and um, the, the sort of the problems with it and the advantages of just being like, yeah, good story. I'm not going to play by those rules. Uh, comes from a series of historical fiction novels by Bernard Cornwell called uh, Sharp's Rifle, Sharp's Gold, Sharp's This and That. And there's a TV series with Sean Bean. Um where he plays Richard Sharp and Richard Sharp is a, he was a, um, an orphan, you know I mean? I, I think he was a son of a prostitute and he grew up poor and he was a criminal. And then he got out of, uh, jail basically by joining the army, which you could do. Right. Um, this was, uh, his story takes place in the beginning before the Napoleonic Wars. I think, uh, he's fighting in, in India, right. With the British and, um, he becomes a sergeant and that's as high as you can get unless you were born nobility. Right. Right. But then during the Napoleonic Wars, or maybe it was actually in the the wars in India, I'm not sure, but he saves, uh, Wellesley's life, right. The, who becomes, uh, Lord Wellington. Um, and he gets promoted to lieutenant. So he becomes an officer, which could happen, right? And and it did happen on rare occasion. And, you know, and the books kind of follow his rise through the British Army during the uh, Peninsular Wars. Um, you know, they're fighting in Portugal and Spain, et cetera, et cetera, against uh, Napoleon. And, you know, there's this idea of honorable combat where you don't shoot the other officer, you know, right. the, the, the commoners shoot the commoners. And then when all the commoners on one side are dead, they take the officer captive and, you know, they have tea and like, you know, so, I mean, it made perfect sense for the officers, right? right for the nobles. The telling people what these rules of honorable combat are. I mean, like exactly. Exactly. And Sharp was like, no, you shoot the horse. Yeah. The horse will fall down, crush the the guy's leg, and then the men will run away because they lost their officer. And then you shoot the officer or maybe take him prisoner or whatever. Right. But like, you know, and, and so it was this real like, you know, um, kind of realistic to me, like view of like, 
yeah, you, you've got the nobility creating these rules to protect themselves, mm-hmm. and yet having you know the the you know the the commoners whatever like massacre themselves against each other, and the, so when you have rules like that to honorable fighting, they're there to protect someone, right? Um, and the question is, who are they there to protect? And I think there are um, ways that you can justify them, you know, mm-hmm. where let's say you have two potent militaries, right? Or you have like two two groups that are going to fight and you say, you know what, instead of having, if it's the opposite, basically, of what I just described, where all the commoners kill each other and then the officers are like, oh, good shot mm-hmm. <laughs> right then. Um, you know, it's, um, I think there's value to be like, okay, we'll send our champion to go fight against your champion. Whoever's champion wins, that side wins, and then we'll throw down our arms and then, you know, and then you get to choose, you know, basically you get to to rule. Um, and I I think there's merit to that. And that's, uh, that has some parallels to, uh, our our world also yeah I mean, I, I, in some regard that almost strikes me as the equivalent of like i said the taekwondo competition or the mma bout you know mm-hmm. where instead of the prize being like a belt or prize money the prize is like you know rulership of a country but right. still to some extent we've agreed like war is a game um right and that's kind of ridiculous to me but but it's a lot less ridiculous to have two people fight rather than two armies Right, so, exactly. So in that regard, I can totally get it. I, I think where, where, I, where I'm definitely seeing it being, being ridiculous, and I'm agreeing with you, is um, where it is more about like, okay, I'm going to kill you and you want to kill me, which, which already seems like kind of a yeah. strange thing to think is a good thing to begin. But like, but right, so right, right. Set, like, if you're trying to kill me, my being remembered for not fighting honorably is a lot lower on the list of priorities for me than my winning this fight. Um, yeah. And, and I think one of the things that I, I think about a lot with this is, like, I thought the point you made was great about there's someone with, with an agenda and a bias who's setting these rules. Mm-hmm. And generally, if it's the person who is, when the rule is we have to fight in this honorable manner, it's probably a person who's very, very good at fighting in an honorable manner who's setting the right. rules. Right. Yeah, and somebody who has more to lose fighting in a non a less honorable manner, yeah, basically. I, I, I mean um, – this is a different version of it, but one thing I think of a lot in this regard is the American Revolution, or frankly, mm-hmm. almost any kind of revolutionary fight. Right. You know, yeah. We have this, you know, by by different definitions, what the American, what the the people who fought for American independence were doing, you could call them guerrilla warfare, you could mm-hmm. call them non traditional warfare, you could right. call them terrorists. Yeah. All of these terms could be applied, um, and I think the, the, there, there's some reason to go into moral judgment of them to be sure. But one of the things, you know, to the British, they were do- what they were doing was incredibly dishonorable because the right, British right. thought, we have an army, you should have an army, and we will stand and fight like two armies. <laughs> right. The fact that the British army was 20 times the size of any American army that could be put together, yeah. far yeah. more trained, you know, it, so it was never going to be a fair fight, but right. it was going to be the pretense of a fair fight. Right. It's like if the U.S. was like, okay, Viet Cong, you all need to come out here and then we'll have our tanks, right. you know. Well, which is in, exactly in, I mean, in Vietnam. one yeah. of the reasons why the Viet Cong were so like brutally mocked as, and not mocked, but like derided as being horribly illegitimate was that they wouldn't just stand and fight. Right. Which coming from Americans is pretty hilarious. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Given that your Revolutionary War reference mm-hmm. to be sure. or, or your American rebellion reference, depending on how you want to look at it. Well, and, and so let's just talk about it now in terms of um, – so I think we can definitely talk about it in terms of like broad armies. But when it is just two people standing one against another uh, yeah. or a couple of people. Um, and, and the scene in Iron Fist that most got – well, there are two scenes in Iron Fist that most got me thinking about this. One is – and uh, spoiler warning. We're going to spoil Iron Fist. We're going to spoil a couple of other things. Um, spoiler warning. The Americans won the Revolutionary War. Um, oh. I, I know. I should have said that before. did they? <laughs> well, OK. There's that too. Um, <laughs> Wouldn't you rather be controlled by Britain right now? <laughs> um, Brexit, not really. So, um, yeah, that's about but yeah, no, the, the point being, there's going to be a lot of spoilers for, for a whole bunch of products, um, but mostly Iron Fist, anything Marvel probably, as well as some Batman I think we're going to talk about, um, and Firefly. I'm definitely going to bring up Firefly. Um, ah. But in Iron Fist, there are these two sort of honorable combats. One is the fight he has with Davos late in the show. 
right. but even more so, there, there's a moment where um, Danny Rand, the Iron Fist, has been screwing with the hand, and the hand basically issues to him this challenge. And, and they issue this challenge, and it, it's sort of set up of, if you come and take part in this challenge, um, which is billed as a fair fight, but then as anything but, um, right. you know, that we will each basically make a bet. And if you win the fight, yeah, yeah, yeah. we will do what you want. If you win the fight, you know, you will do what we want. If not, you're not dead. And the fight winds up being three different fights, none of which are fair, all of which are done in really, pro- you know, kind of, you know, ways to kind of screw with him. And then at the end of the fight, Madame Gao breaks all the rules anyway. Um, <laughs> and I, I because of course she does. Yeah, and I, I just, I can't, it, like, the whole thing just struck me as so ridiculous. And, like, why are you going through with any of this? Well, so so I feel like Pirates of the Caribbean must be referenced here. Okay. <laughs> where, you know, she breaks the rules because she's a super villain, uh-huh. you know? <laughs> and I, I think having a some kind of challenge like that makes a little bit of sense. Wait, wait, you know, what's the Pirates unless, of the Caribbean reference? I'll get to that. Okay. Um, un, unless, you know, your, your enemy is a super villain, you know? Uh-huh. And I think they're very deliberately trying to um, – reference uh the the bruce lee movie um game of death i think uh-huh. where he fights uh kareem abdul jabbar at the end <laughs> right. um and you know but he's like going up floors of a warehouse you know which is like it's like ridiculous but it's awesome because it's bruce lee you know and and if this was bruce lee like probably would have been awesome um but uh, you know what brandon lee would have made an interesting danny rant anyway going back <laughs> Uh, but so what? Oh yeah. So in Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, the first fight between Johnny Depp's character and Orlando Bloom, right? Um, mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> like like Johnny Depp's a pirate, right? He's Captain Jack Sparrow, and they're fighting, and then he does something, and uh, Will Turner, the Orlando Bloom character, is like, "That was dishonorable," and he's like, "Pirate." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, like, duh, I'm a fucking pirate. You right. know, like. And and that's the thing is uh, I I, I th- it didn't bother me within the context of the show because I do feel like I mean it's actually it's one of the things that I think makes more sense among like all of all of the ridiculous corporate uh, you know machinations like the idea that Danny would have been raised with this idea no of honorable combat this is how you fight you know right. and that the hands would be like. Yeah, um, <clears throat> we'll we'll do that thing you do with the honorable <laughs> combat thing, wink, wink, and then like, oh yeah, we were just kidding, you know. Like, so, so you, we're you, obviously your take kidding. on that scene wasn't that the hand like has this dedication to honorable combat as well, but that they're they just know that he does, so they're using that to exploit him. Yes, yes, that that's my take on that, um, and maybe I'm giving too much credit where it's not due, but I I, I do feel like that was, you know, like. Weren't wasn't there a whole thing where they were talking about the hand and how the hand were like oh no that was that was not Danny's perspective that was the um the guys the leader of the guys with the the butcher knives or the hatchets the hatchet um, oh right okay that that right. other, one of the yeah they're hatchets, like but, yeah right but so like you know we we don't have any reason to believe that Danny's had actual contact with the hand right oh no Before. He, he's heard about them his whole life right in Kunlun, right. But- yeah, so if he was raised with this idea of honorable combat, and then he goes and fights someone who he thinks, you know, well, yeah, like they're, I mean, maybe they would have told him that they were like dishonorable, but but at the same time, you know, if they're like their immortal enemy, like maybe maybe he does have reason to think like, okay, well, yeah, I guess this is how we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the and that said, like he doesn't really have a lot of other options. Besides just, like, doing what they want him to do. Right. You know, because they have all the leverage. Um, and so, you know, it, it it makes sense to me for Madame Gao to set some up some kind of challenge where she can um, – what I thought would have been much more interesting is if the, the main purpose of that challenge was to, like, observe him, you know. And maybe it was. Maybe it was to be like, let's see the Iron Fist. Let's see what he can do. Um, there's a – Spoilers for the uh, the series Kenshin. Uh, there's a Japanese animation series Kenshin about um, oh, which he's he's this former you know they call him Batusai, the manslayer, right? Like he during the um, 
uh, revolution in, in uh, Japan, I think, um, he just like killed a lot of people. And then he decided, I'm not going to kill people anymore. So he had a reverse blade katana. Right. Um, and so he'd go around fighting some, but he wouldn't kill anybody. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and he had a sword, but it, the blade was on backwards, which would have made a lot more sense for someone like uh, Colleen Wing, who just kept trying not to kill people, but she was fighting with a sword. Like, right. a sword is not a good weapon for not killing people. Kind of like arrows in the show Arrow, but yes, go Exactly, on. exactly. So that's, you know, that's a, that's its own thing. But um, there's a there's a, a few episodes, spoilers, um, where he's he there's somebody who, who has to fight him or wants to fight him in the future, right? But what he does is he has all of his minions fight him, like, in a row, like one, then the next, then the next. And the point is to get them to force him to show his techniques, right? And he gets mad at one of his, he's like, you didn't even uh, force him to use his most powerful technique. Like, what use are you to me now? Like, your whole purpose was to lose, right? right? But to lose in a way that we got to see how that person fights. Mm. The same way, like, someone sitting, you know, standing in the on-deck circle, like like Keith Hernandez, right? The Mets' uh, first baseman from their championship Right, you want the guy in front of you to take some pitches, you can see what the pitcher's going to do. Right, he wants, he said, you know, whenever he was the first left-handed batter in the lineup, he would always try to take some pitches so that the other lefties in the lineup could see how the, what the pitcher had to use to work against a lefty, right? And he'd say when there was somebody, you know, when there, when like Mookie was leading off or whatever, and, you know, when you had a lefty up against a righty or whatever, he'd, he'd want them to see, he'd want to be able to see what the pitcher was offering them. And, and so I think that could have been like a brilliant little kind of, you okay. know, we're going to have this staged combat kind of thing so we can understand his strengths. We can understand his weaknesses. And then we're going to use that in the future that, you know, they, they didn't quite, quite go there. But no, I, I do like that. I, I think, and I, I, I think that's one way to headcanon it, you know, is the kind of term to like, you know, mm-hmm. write in something else to explain it, or even the, the other way, way you're going of if the point of it, because I guess, what I, the way I viewed that scene was that Danny believed in honorable combat, that everyone in his life was saying, like, why are you doing this? And he was saying, because at least whatever the hand is, the hand believes in honorable combat. Yeah. And then at the end, Madame Gao did something that seemed totally dishonorable to me. And right. he was just like, well, what are you going to do? It's what I have to do. Um, right, right. And, and I just was so frustrated by that. I, I think you know, an interesting reading of it could have been, and a way the show could have gone, and in an earlier episode, we talked about, um, you know, some failings in the TV show. Right, and maybe right, right. Just another Human failing. Um, but what I would have loved is if that had been, if the whole point of that had been for Danny to realize, you know, to go back to his friends and be like, you know what, you're right. This whole honorable combat thing is bullshit. Like, that's, that, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. It, it didn't do that, but I, no. I, I like the idea that maybe that was what it was, it was trying to do, even if it did it very poorly. Um, right. Because, yeah, because that, it, it, it just, Especially because he is so – there's so much of Danny and of Iron Fist that is supposed to be like literally otherworldly. You know, he's supposed to be saying mm-hmm. like, you know – and, and I, I kind of feel like one of the things he's supposed to be believing is, you know, your world doesn't fight honorably. I do. Um, right. And and I, I have trouble believing that and certainly that scene makes me think, well, your way is stupid, Danny. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I mean it's – it is and it isn't. Like it's – it's fine as long as everybody plays according to those rules right. and those rules aren't set up to, you know, if they actually create exploit an, an actual people, honest. Front. Yeah. I mean, like, exactly. Like we, we have a friend, Logan, who, who's been a, a, a podcast guest and, and I know hopefully will be again. And I know he hates guns. Um, right. And I've thought a lot about the conversation we've had with him because I, I, I hate guns as well. I'm very anti-gun politically, yeah. but, but I will say the idea of like, you know that 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 no one person should ever ha- it should ever be that easy to kill somebody else. I, right. I I believe that. Yeah. But I also say that as a person who is fairly large and fairly strong, and it is fairly easy for me to kill somebody else. Like I mean, I I have never done it clearly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say like. Eh. I, I just I, mean, I don't like, mean like physically. I mean just like you yeah, know. <laughs> I'm not a martial artist, but I mean like I, if I. Punch, no, I just meant like like I don't. I don't think you'd want to kill someone. Oh much. yeah, no, by no means. But I mean, I think Logan or I would much more easily <laughs> get to the. Uh, anyway, it's <laughs> not an admission of guilt to any future. <laughs> Reminder to the NSA agents who are listening in on this: we're just yeah. talking hypothetically. But, but hypothetically. But but no, the point. Be, I mean, like 
I am a I am a person of a yeah. physical strength in which I could do real damage. Yeah. And I imagine someone who was much smaller than me, who faced the prospect of fighting me, would say like the idea of unarmed combat between any two people being inherently fair is utterly ridiculous. Yeah. Right, and so there's an idea that that guns are the great equalizer, where it's like, well, anybody, can, you know, as right. long if everybody has a gun, then it's you know, right, and um, I, anybody can defend themselves. With there guns. are other reasons why I hate that idea, but there is yeah. some truth that, that there is some truth to, just to that idea of you know that that because that, 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 there's a rejection of that idea that two, any two people is going to be a fair fight, you know, because a lot of times right. it's not going to be. Um, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, um, and if. And the other thing is, like, if the other side has guns, then, like, you, you kind of would like to have guns, yeah. you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh. Well, and, and that's – and there's another issue, and we'll get into where that goes in a second, is the – well, actually, yeah, let's go into that right now, which is the – when you've committed – and let's, for the moment, talk specifically about superheroes, though I think we can definitely take this metaphorically somewhere else as well, and we will. But if you have made a commitment to fight fairly and the other side starts not doing so – at what point mm. should you start breaking the rules as well? You know, it, it, I, it's a good question. Does it make sense to follow a rule that your opponent is not following? Yeah. So I, th- I think the question, I mean, it's hard for me to not just jump right ahead to the kind of metaphorical, non-physical fight. Um, but I mean, when it, when it comes to physical fighting, I mean, if they're, no, it doesn't matter either way. I think it's how much value do you, place on the rules and and the idea of honor and you know are you willing to risk your life um because you're 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 basically accepting a higher chance of losing by not breaking the rules right right? when the other person's breaking the rules um and if the if the rules themselves are so important to you that you're willing to accept that higher chance of being defeated and or killed Mm -hmm. then then you don't break the rules but if um you value your you know chances of victory greater than you value those rules then it's time to be like all right we're done with the rules right like you're not you're not playing by the rules you know there's no point in me playing for it it only really makes sense if both people do it but let's say you have a hundred people on each side and, you know, there's a hundred separate matches or whatever, or, you know, there's going to be things in the future. If one person breaks them one time and then you say, okay, you broke them, but I'm still going to respect the rules so that more people don't start, you know, so that we're not, yeah, um, so that I don't really create an avalanche. Right. Right. And I, and I think here, I guess there's, there's two different things that I think are relevant and then yell yeah, it. We can get into the metaphor cause it's so clearly right there. Um, mm-hmm. Like uh, the first level is what's what is the result of losing? You know, because like I I play the game Magic the Gathering a lot, um, yeah. and every now and then uh, I, I'm a judge now, so I'm I'm supposed to be watching out even more so, and I, and I do. But before I was a judge, you know, there were instances where I, I'm pretty sure I saw people cheating, um, right. and I might try and stop them from cheat and I, from cheating to be sure. Um, but um, and I, I um, I'm not even talking about it in a formal setting. I just mean like you know if we're playing at home or a kitchen table right. or something like that. I, my losing that game isn't that important to me, you know. Like right. and certainly not enough that I'm going to cheat as well. Yeah. Um, if I'm playing Magic to the death, um, which right. I, I, I hope, is, but, but <laughs> okay, I hope it's not ever going to happen. But, I really don't want that to be a thing, but I kind of do. <laughs> You know? um, it, it would make watching the. I watch the Pro Tour of Magic. Cause I'm a huge geek, and I already yeah. enjoy it. But that would make it a lot more interesting. Um, Raise the stakes. But but I mean, like, okay, as a better example, you know, you and I both play poker, and like, the, right. the higher the stakes, if I'm betting my life savings on a poker hand, I, I, you know, honestly, that I would cheat, which you should that, never do. Cheating, like, matters much more to me. Um, yes. And 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 cheating maybe isn't even the best. It, Best, um, Poker's actually a really interesting parallel. Oh, sure. Because it's not even about cheating as much as it's sort of about breaking the unwritten rules, you know? Because yeah, well, in like, in poker, we, we call it angle shooting, basically. Right. Like, yeah. you know, where somebody takes the rules as they're written and they find a way to basically exploit those rules in a direct effort to manipulate someone else. And I mean, it is cheating, but it's not cheating. You right, know, they're, they're obeying uh, the letter, but very much not the spirit of the law in some way or another. Exactly. Well, yeah. And I, and I think but, but my point being, 
if the stakes are a lot higher for me, then I think I'm maybe more willing to, to, to try and bend those rules myself a little bit if I feel like the other person's doing it. But even more so, I think, and here's the thing that comes up a lot for me, especially with superheroes, is if it's not just me who has something to lose. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And here we can definitely draw an allusion to politics because what drives me insane is when I see a superhero in a situation where if they lose this fight, something bad happens to a lot of other people. Yes. Maybe just oh, I have a, a great example. Yeah, maybe just a couple of hostages are killed. Maybe like the, the, the villain's evil plan you know, goes through. Right. In a situation like that, when the when the hero is saying, I want to win, but I'm going to compromise my possibility of winning in order to make sure I fight by a set of rules that my opponent is not following, mm-hmm. I'm I, to me, I'm now like, you egotistical bastard, you're putting all these other people's lives at stake for the preservation of your honor. And yes. that's not okay to me in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, um, so... And, 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 Do you I, have an example? Or? I, I was going to say, and I, I also think a second issue, which I want to get into later, is a thing you brought up about the slippery slope. But let's just start right here. So, yeah, go for your example. Um, so this is a Batman example. And um, I think it's a great example partially because it um, – to me, like this is a very like not my Batman moment. Right. But um, I think it was written by Kevin Smith actually. And it's a comic where – it's about that whole like Batman needs the Joker, Joker needs the Batman, blah, 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 blah. And Batman and Joker, I think, are fighting on a rooftop. And there's this serial killer who's been um, – he's just, he kills superheroes, right? And he has like a collection of superhero costumes at home from superheroes who he's killed. Right. And Bat- I, I forget exactly how it happens, but somehow the Joker gets shot, right? Mm-hmm. And he's bleeding out. And – Batman could apprehend this serial killer who kills lots of superheroes, or he could take the Joker to the hospital so he doesn't bleed to death. Right. And so Batman decides to take the Joker to the hospital so he doesn't bleed to death, because if he doesn't do that, then the Joker will die, and he'll have been responsible for his death, basically. And he feels like, well, that would be violating my like not killing people rule that I've set for myself. Right. Which I think is just utterly absurd Mm -hmm. because letting this serial killer escape, he's going to kill other superheroes. And you might be like, well, I'm a superhero and superheroes can fight for themselves, yada, yada, yada. But like superheroes don't fight for themselves. They fight for other people. So not only are the deaths, you know, the potential deaths of all those other superheroes on your hands, Batman, um, but – also, all the people that they could have helped if they didn't get killed by this guy in the future. Yeah. You know? And so it, it's really this, you know, like, what are you fighting for? Like, it, it, and there it seems like he's handcuffed. He allows himself, you know, self to become handcuffed by rules he set for himself that, that he thinks this is what he considers honorable. And there's, and, you know, in general, I'm very much for the idea of Batman being like, no, I'm not going to. Um, kill people because Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, um, because if I go around killing people that like, who knows what would happen kind of basically. Right. right? Um, like I think that is a good rule for him to set for himself. But, but I, I also think that, you know, the Batman that I would write would be like, well, you know, I, I, I'm not going to kill you, but I I don't have to save you. You know, like it's more important for me to save the people that that person's going to kill. Well, and I think that there's two really key points here, one of which is uh, – and I um, I studied this in ethics and I can't remember the exact n- name for this. But there, there's basically a phenomenon in the study of ethics where they talk about that it it is much easier for a person to fix a small but incredibly visible problem yeah, than yeah. – and, and that they, often they will do that at the expense – like if, if there's a question of like – if you shoot a bullet into a person's head right now, a hundred mm-hmm. million people who you will never see and never meet and never experience won't die. Like, right. from a purely mathematical standpoint, that should ha- there should be no question at all there. And like you can right, right. you can argue with any hypothetical that you never want to take a positive, awful action. But but still, that part of it is that like the physical like I am going to watch this one. I could save this one physical person I can see right in front of me. Or yeah. it can be in the back of my mind aware that 100 million people did or didn't die because of me. Like, right. and, and I think it's a real problem, and I think it's one thing these movies and TV shows 
far too often they have our heroes deal with that immediate problem instead of the larger thing. Um, yeah, totally. So, and, and, and but the other thing is, and I'm glad you brought up Batman because I think he's such an interesting foil to an Iron Fist. To me, the difference between what Batman is doing versus like what Danny or the Hand is doing is that Batman has set a code for himself that he's trying yes. to follow. Yes. He never expects anyone – there isn't an idea of like, OK, Joker, you and I have agreed to the same code and we must fight by the same code. I right. Mean, he's not doing it like he thinks it's for honor. He's doing it because he just thinks it's the right thing for him to do. Right. Well, and, and, I, and I would say that – And he's not holding anyone else to it. Right. And I, except I, for all the other superheroes. <laughs> well, because I, I, my take on it would be that at least in some versions, what he, in his mind, the Joker has already broken the code. Mm-hmm. And the idea mm-hmm. is that the code is what keeps him from becoming like Joker. Right. You know. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous for somebody who thinks they're the, a hero to to think that a villain should hold themselves to that standard right. that they're holding themselves. Right. Like. I, I mean, and then you get into questions of identity because probably all those villains also think they're heroes as well. But, but right. So the hero could think, well, they think they're the hero, so they, you know, but. But right, but it, but it's that it's the it's it's um. Uh, here we're going a totally different geeky geeky direction, but like the, there's a, a role playing game that you and I have both played a lot, Vampire the Masquerade, where the mm-hmm. whole idea of it is that as a vampire you have this beast inside of you that just wants to be like pure feral rage and anger, and that you the way you sort of keep it in check is by adopting a moral code that sort of allows you to kind of like ride the wave of that to some extent, but never fully give into it. Right, um, and I kind of see that's what Batman's thinking because you know he kind of recognizes like he is stepping outside the bonds of what a civilized person is supposed to do by doing right. the stuff he does, and I think he's recognizing like how easy it would be for him to become, if not Joker, Ra's al Ghul. You know? mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, totally, and, and then him having a code is what stops him from going that far. Yeah, and he's basically saying, you know, I'm casting aside the code that society at large has set. Like, I'm just that, – that's not what I'm playing by. Right. So I need to have something for myself so that I don't, you know, end up like like Raish. Right. Which is interesting because now, now as I think of it, I realize not not the Joker. I am very intentionally not the Joker. But most of the other kind of villains, especially the kind of Raish types, they have a code as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. They do. You know, there's often a lot of like kind of that ritual combat stuff in the race mm-hmm. in races mm-hmm. world and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um so let let's let's dive into the, 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 the real world aspect of it. And I, I guess the way I'd start by doing that is by asking what what do you think is either the the benefit or or probably much more so the, the, the problematic nature of romanticizing this kind of honorable fair fight uh in terms of the real world? <sighs> I mean, I think like in just a person to person kind of small world, you know, street level like um, application, like the idea that if you're defending yourself, you should do so in an honorable way. I just think is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, And people who are who need to take whatever action they need to take to defend themselves, um, I think, uh, you know, they, they might come to, to bad ends, you know, um, when they otherwise wouldn't, if they weren't trying to defend themselves, quote unquote, honorably, you know, that said, like maybe if someone like George Zimmerman had more of a a code, (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then, you know, maybe Trayvon Martin would be alive today. So it, it, I, I guess that, you know, until that example popped into my head, like, uh, it, it didn't really occur to me that, yeah, maybe there is some value in terms of like if – all right. So so here's a thing that yeah, like – I, I, I would just say I, I don't think that the fair fight was the problem in the, in the Zimmerman, Trayvon Martin well, situation. But but I, I understand where you're generally going. Go on. No, I think I think it is. I think it is. Um, so, and, and here I'm going to – okay. So there used to be a thing, right, like – or maybe there still is, like of people being like, do you want to step outside? And then they'd fight. And but they'd fight. They wouldn't fight with weapons, right? They just beat each other up some, and then somebody would win, and then they'd leave, and they'd be like, "Yeah, I won." And like, I don't know how much of a thing that is or was, but like, the idea of being like, "Okay, 
we have come to a point in our conversation or our arguing where we've decided that we want to fight each other. Right. But we've agreed that, you know, we don't want to fight each other lethally. You know, we don't we're not going to use weapons. You know, we're agreeing not to use weapons um, where we are, um, you know, maybe we're agreeing not to hit each other in the nuts because like, you know, a, you know, mm-hmm. like maybe even we're agreeing not to hit each other in the face. I don't know. Right. Um, and it maybe does seem like well, not to tell our wives about how we got beaten up. I mean, that's right. a big part of those things as well, like exactly. in that particular cultures. Right. Exactly. Um, and. And so, you know, you would think, well, if you if you can agree to all of these stipulations, can you just agree not to fight? Right. right? But like maybe you can't, you know, and so maybe having these kind of um, sort of restrictions on a on a fight that's, you know, it's like it's a fight for pride or honor or whatever kind of what I would think is kind of a stupid idea and something that I wouldn't get in a fight over. Right. But like. But that maybe people decide they have to fight over these things. And I do think, yeah, it's better if they decide to have these rules that mean nobody's – like you could get hurt or you could get injured, yeah. you know. And there's a difference between being hurt and injured. And I, I've always kind of had this like – like in 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 Taekwondo, like I, I never cared about getting hurt, you know. Right. Like, yeah, you get punched, you get a bruise, ow, you know, it's painful, this or that, whatever. Um, or you kick someone in the elbow and you bruise yourself, right? Mm-hmm. But injured is like you break a bone, right? right. Injured is – There's some you know, damage you to, that's been done to you besides bruises that will heal. Right. There's some damage that's going to that's gonna last and, and might even and it cause long-term problems. Um, so I, I do think there's, there's some merit to saying like, hey, we can fight in a way that we're going to get hurt a little bit. You know, and we'll live with that. We'll just deal with that. But like we're, we're not going to – try to cause great injury to each other, you know, and certainly not fatal injury. And, and to bring it back to the George Zimmerman thing, um, you know, when, but also our dis, dislike of guns, I, I think if there were more of a, less a culture of like, you know, we're going to have guns and then try and defend our neighbor. I mean, whatever he That's obviously that's bullshit, but like, but if the culture was more like, well, you know, I, I, for whatever, whatever it is, even just like, I don't like this person for totally bullshit reasons. If the response were, so let's have a fist fight instead of I'm going to shoot you. Like, yeah, I think the world would be a little better. Like, of course it would be better if it was just like, yeah, just leave each other. Just leave the other person alone. Like, don't, I I mean, I see, I see where you're going. I, I still think the Zimmerman is a bad example because I mean, he didn't ask Trayvon Martin if he wanted to have a fight, and Trayvon Martin had no, had no ability to say yes. no to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also think there it wasn't a, I want to have a fight with you as a way of like getting this out of my system. It was, you know, I think you, Trayvon Martin, are dangerous because of my racist ideas of of right. young black. Yes. So, so I, I, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't think that example fits, but I do get your overall point. Um, and, and I think you're right. I mean, I think because there again, that's probably like, you know, we think of like, you know. Kunlun martial arts fighting is having their idea of ritual combat. Right. But two guys behind a bar on a Saturday night is probably just as much ritualized combat in that regard. Yeah, you yeah, know? it is. And, and I, I guess to me, so, okay, so let, let's take that. Let's go to that second point you were making, you know, the slippery slope thing. Um, where, where do you see that that's the problem of like when it is the um, – the, the, uh, the, Actually, no, I'm sorry. I'm going to back up a second because I I, I want to go into the politics stuff, which is where I was yeah, taking us with yeah. the real world thing. Because I think yeah. to, to me, I, I, I'm with you that there is some value to that. But I think that the problem is to me, like, like, like I was saying before, the issue is when there's something more on the line. You know, like <laughs> if, if the two guys outside the bar are saying the end result of which of this is going to be which one of us gets a little more beaten up and which one of us gets a little shamed in front of our friends, play by whatever rules you want. If, right. if the end result is whichever one of us wins, you know, gets to basically just take over the other person's family and do terrible things to them, but, then yeah. no, frankly, if you're if you're in danger of losing that fight, you grab some gravel, you grab an empty beer bottle, you you know, you fight dirty because there's other people counting on you. Um, yes. And and to me, that part of my part of the reason why I think this is so concerning is because I do see in and and politics today is the, is the best example I can give, but I see in other places where 
I see people saying we have to fight honorably, and frankly, I'm the one who's going to suffer, or other like oppressed people are going to suffer because someone else wants to fight honorably. Um, and, and I guess yeah. So so what what's your take there on on um, like how how do we figure out where to draw those lines? Um, well, I okay. So to me, the I kind of shy away from using the phrase slippery slope. Yep. Um, but it. But it is sort of in that realm. Um, but what I'd say is that when an individual breaks or bends the rules, then you can, as a group, be like, they broke the rules. Let's hold them accountable. Right. Let's hold them responsible for breaking the rules. Or, you know, yeah, they're going to break. The, and even if they continue to break them a little bit, like that's one person. That's one thing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um when you get an entire party just flat out saying we we don't care about the rules anymore right you know the rules are are not important to us and when that's the group that's um in power then you can't just be like oh well they don't care about the rules they could do whatever they want it's like well now the rules aren't working the rules are done yeah you know and that doesn't mean necessarily you throw out all the rules but like the rules that they're breaking you definitely don't have to abide by those anymore you know I, like I, I, the, go ahead. I was just gonna say that i think the most obvious example is is the like supreme court nominations yeah right where um you know you had a, a conservative justice die right and you had a, a democratic president with 10 months al- almost a full year left in office, right? Right. He nominated a fairly centrist justice. Yeah, moderately Um, liberal, but yeah, it's it's definitely moderate. Yeah, I mean, you know, we can argue where he fits on the scale, but you can't say he's far left and you, you know, so, okay, let's, let's give, I'll give you left of center, right? But like fairly, fairly moderate. Right. Um, and, you know, the opposition party the, who had control of um, the Senate, right, mm-hmm. um, of both houses of Congress, they basically just said, we don't think that you're, you know, even though the Constitution says this is your job and that our job is to hold uh, a hearing, we're just not going to do that. And they gave a bunch of bullshit reasons. Um, and then, you know, during a debate, you know, their candidates like Cruz was asked so during your last year in office, if you win, will you not nominate anybody mm-hmm. and leave the lift to the next president? And he just wouldn't answer the question. Um, and then, you know, they said something about, well, n- no one's ever been confirmed in a presidential election year, which isn't true. And then moderator said, well, that's actually not true in 1988, blah, blah, blah. I think Kennedy. Um, and then the crowd booed when the moderator gave the facts. Right. <laughs> so they literally booed the facts. Um, and... And then the thing that makes it even more outrageous is that during the the campaign, towards the end of uh, the presidential campaign, like McCain and some others came out and they're like, yeah, if Clinton wins, we're not going to hold hearings on her nominees either. Right. Just, so yeah, they, just, just acknowledging that the, the rule – you know that, that they were going to yeah. take advantage of that loophole to just ignore the rule entirely. Right. Exactly. And so – you know, then when, um, you know, they get the presidency and they get a, a you know, far right um, nominee, but it doesn't even matter left or right, whatever. It's like their nominee, right. right? They're just like, oh, well, you shouldn't obstruct because, you know, th- then th- that's hypocritical. It's like, no, it's not hypocritical when one person says, let's follow this rule. The other person says or the other group says, fuck this rule, then the first side is like, it's like, why? No. <laughs> like Us then saying, we're not saying we should follow this rule so that just we follow this rule. We're saying everybody should follow this rule because it's the rule. And then once the other side has shown utter disdain for it and come to the point where it's clear that they have no intention to abide by you know, whether they're the written rules or the unwritten rules, once the other side has made it clear, they're like, no, we're done with that. Right. Then there's there's no value left to it. I, I, Whereas I, if it were just one person, it would be like, OK, you know, let's try to 
let's try to keep the rest of that party like thinking this is a good rule to have. I, I mean, to take it all the way back to it, to me, there's a perfect analogy here of what what the Republicans did in that regard in terms of the Supreme Court and the way the Democrats fell for it feels very much to me exactly like what Madame Gao does in that whole fair fight. You know, yes. it's like they know that the left is going to play by the rules, and so they're like, "Fine, we will make you do a fair fight, and we're going to pull, we're going to change the rules at the last minute anyway." Um, right. And, and I guess so. That's because because here's the flip side. Because I do. I mean, you know, I can talk about politics forever. I want I want sure. to focus on the question, but but frame it in terms of how it's going to affect the politics. To me, you know what's one of the most dishonorable things you can possibly do is to run up to a Nazi while he's giving an interview and, and just sucker punch him. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing in any way honorable about that. That's that's accurate. That's fair. And you and I gave an entire <laughs> podcast, and, and I, I still think I want people to do that. Right, right. And and so I'm asking you to kind of like, – Like specifically to a Nazi who's presently Naziing. Right, exactly, exactly. So – how, and I don't want to re- redo that whole um, podcast, but I think it's fair to bring up that same question in terms of th- this question of – so isn't that starting the slippery slope? Because now doesn't it become fair game for every anti-abortion person to say someone giving a speech in favor of choice is you know in that moment they are threatening um, you know lives of innocent fetuses. So they should be pun- – like, like not the slippery slope, but like you said, the like – if if the only if there are thirty people watching me hold up the rules while right, someone right. else breaks them, yeah, me holding the rules while they break the rules means that maybe those other people are going to keep the rules as well. But once yes. we're both breaking the rules, even more people are going to break the rules. Like where so so where where does that fall? You know, I mean, I, I think it's sort of like the way a civil war works. Mm-hmm. You know, like you have you have one group in power right then you have another group that starts doing some stuff and then they're like yeah we're a separate group and we're trying to take power and they fight and they fight and they fight and then eventually someone wins or maybe they don't and you just call it two separate countries um like in korea they're still at war right um but in like in the u.s you know the 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 union one the north one whatever and then you know the South surrenders and the Confederacy and and then it's like, okay, now we're gonna go back to having, you know, the rule of law the way it was before, and um you know, you I think we're at a point in in politics where there's you know yeah, where it's it's war. I mean it's political war, you know. And I I don't think one side just sticking their fingers in the air is going, no, 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 it's fine. Everything's fine. Nah, nah, nah. You know, like we just have to stick by the rules and keep everything, um, the, you know, the status quo, whatever you can't, it's done. That's over. Mm-hmm. You know, now you're at war. You have to win. First yeah. of all, you have to fight that political war. You have to win. You know, I've got a bunch of ideas of how you could do that. And a lot of different people have different ideas. Um, but like, and then once you win, then you, you find ways to kind of recodify the system. And and then you say, okay, you know, now we're going to go back to behaving like in a way that we think is politically honorable, basically, mm-hmm. like we're going to follow the rules. And, and I think that's, um, you know, it's sort of like uh, not, to, you know, to, to use your example of Mandela, basically, right. you know, uh, being like, you know, we're, we're not going to, um, you know, cleanse the country of all the people who were complicit in the oppression. You know, what we're going to do is we're kind of going to like reboot, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I think that's that's something that, you know, you can do that. And and uh, it's, you know, it's hard. And it's like, at what point do you do that? You know, do you try to do that like in a year, you know, does it take four years? Does it, you know, when, how much, how much progress do you have to make before you get to the point where you can do that? But like, yeah, I, I, I do think, first of all, I don't think it's totally crazy for somebody who has the, the viewpoint that fetuses are, you know, human lives that need to be protected, which I, I do think is a crazy viewpoint, but I think once someone has that viewpoint, um, I don't think it's crazy for them to go up and punch someone in the face who's, you know, um, advocating for availability of abortions. Right. Um, 
I think there's a big difference between going up and punching them in the face and, you know, bombing an abortion clinic right. or assassinating a, a, a doctor, you know, which it's like we were talking about punching Nazis in the face. We weren't talking about blowing up, you know, Nazi, you know, the KKK headquarters. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, yeah, there's a point at which, you know, if if you believe A, then doing B makes sense, right? But it, but like sometimes, you know, if you disagree strongly enough with A, then like doing B, it's like is outrageous, right? Uh, no, and I, I agree with you. And this is actually where I want to, um, because I, I think part of what you're talking about is that like it, it's kind of where we started at the beginning. Like the honorable fight works if everyone is agreed and everyone is following the rules, but that once once one side starts breaking the like. I guess maybe like a slippery slope isn't the right analogy. It's better to think of it as an avalanche. Like yeah, yeah. that there's a point at which you can say, and, and it's hard to judge, and I guess you can always fight about it, but like there's a point at which you can say, by my continuing to hold up the rules while one person breaks them, it becomes possible for like the larger group to reassert the idea that we still want the rules to be upheld. You know? Yes. But like you said – Part of that is that idea that the larger community still believes in the rules and that they're going to punish the person who's breaking the rules. Right. The audience, the audience booed when they pointed mm -hmm. out the facts, you know, like in the American system, we've, we've passed that point. And I think that's the, like, you have to be aware of when that tipping point has been reached. And I, um, here I want to bring in what I I think is a great example for this is Firefly and particularly the character Mm -hmm. of Malcolm Reynolds. Um, Yeah. I'm going to have some, some big spoilers here, but frankly, if you're you're listening to this podcast while you haven't seen Firefly already, I really question what you're doing with your life. Yeah, <laughs> stop listening to this podcast. Go watch go watch uh, Firefly, then watch Serenity, then, yes, then we can then talk. Then come back. Um, but frankly, I think this is a good podcast. That's, be- that's a better use of your time. Um, <laughs> but Malcolm Reynolds is someone who has a very interesting and I think very complicated and nuanced approach to honor. Because at first, I mean, it seems like he has no honor. And I, you told that story at the start of Sharp shooting the horse. You know, in the first right. episode of Firefly, that's exactly what Malcolm does. Yeah. You know, he, he doesn't have a fair fight. Um, in part. By the way, I think that's messed up because of the horse. Not right. because of... <laughs> it's like poor the horse. Definitely true. Um, ASPCA is not happy there. Yeah. But part of the situation there is he recognizes that isn't a fair fight to begin with. Like he's right. been suckered. You know, they're trying to outsmart. They're trying to, to hoodwink him. But then there are other situations where he ver- – for him, honor in fighting is very important. You know, he says at one point to the doctor, to Stephen, um, um, you know, he says like – you know, he's afraid that, that Malcolm might kill him. And he says, listen, son, you know, if, if I ever shoot you, you're going to be face-to-face to me and you're going to have a gun in your hand. Like what he's saying right. is I'm not going to kill you dishonorably. Yes. Um, and similarly, there's that one scene where the, he he gets, basically gets into a bar fight with people um, over um, uh, the alliance question, um, and 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 he basically says like, look, it was just it was just a good honest fight between good folks, you know, like, mm-hmm. he, and I because I think for him, he has this belief of if everyone is following the rules, then I'm going to follow the rules too, and those rules are important, and we're going to follow the rules. But then when you know patience tries to to screw him over. He has no problem screwing her over back. Um, right. Or when he basically gets talked into having this sword fight, a duel for which he's radically, you know, unprepared in the fight where he goes the, – the episode where he um, – Yeah, yeah. He goes With to Inara. Inara's pl- the planet where Nara and the guy wa- – I mean he wins that fight in a completely unfair way, you know? Yeah. He's about to lose. Inara distracts the guy who's going to kill him. He takes advantage of that distraction and wins the fight. Yeah. Nothing honorable in the slightest about that, but I think he's okay with that because he's recognizing that's a situation where people have stopped being honorable, and so it's okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I mean that's the thing. It's like we can have a set of rules, and we can say, okay, these are the rules, and then one side really can when it's when it's rules that you're only bound by honor to follow. One side really can just unilaterally say, yeah, I'm not going to follow those. Yep, um, and to kind of bring it back to the the um, the political comparison, really, it was in 2009 when you know the Republican Party just decided, okay, we're just going to blanketly oppose basically every single thing Obama wants to do, right? Mm-hmm. And 
you know, the check on that was supposed to be the voters, right? Like the voters are supposed to say, oh, you're not participating in government in good faith. You're not following the rules. We're going to vote you out of office. What happened? The opposite, right? That that was that that was a very successful approach. They managed to block a ton of stuff. They continued that for a number of years. They didn't get the presidency in 2012, but then in 2014, I think that they won the Senate. Then is mm-hmm. that correct? Yep. Um, and then in 2016, after all of that obstruction, it seemed like well, you know, the voters aren't going to let them get away with that, right? Right. I mean, they're just that's just a complete, you know. They're just uh, complete dereliction of duty. They're just they're just like, we're not going to do our job. Our job is to hold a hearing. And their job isn't to confirm the nominee. Their job is to hold a hearing. Right, to give a fair hearing and, and at least uh, right. allow the, the process to potentially work. Yeah, and that would have been, you know what, if they'd held a hearing and been like, nah, you know, and voted against him, like, that would have been one thing. And people would have said, well, that's just a political blah, 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 but like, I think there would have been a much weaker argument against them, against total um, – there, uh, for – there would have been a weaker argument against currently, like now, having – just being totally obstructionist. Uh, whereas now, I think it's like, well, that was just so, – and the voters didn't hold them accountable, mm-hmm. right? So so that's basically clear that the the party doesn't – want to to cooperate at all, even with a, a president who says, you know, I'm going to try really hard to, to be bipartisan and who I think tried way too hard to be bipartisan um, and was very much into following the rules. But then he broke some of the rules. I mean, mm-hmm. in terms of, you know, he was big on trying to do things through executive order because he couldn't do it otherwise. Um Right, and this is where, and I, and I think, I mean, it is important, I think, to mention just because uh, this isn't a, not that this is a politics podcast, but just to, to hear all sides. Like, there's an argument to be made that it actually goes much further back to the way the Democrats treated the uh, nomination of Robert Bork. Um, right, right. I, I, I personally would disagree I mean, with Bork that. Bork is a verb, right? Yeah, to, to be Borked, <laughs> and I, my point just being, I think, uh, you know, I, I've done a lot of like couples therapy, like as a therapist, um, mm-hmm. and one thing we talk about a lot is that. One of the problems is is when you get into these cycles of blame, where it right. becomes one side saying, well, you broke the rules, so I can break the rules, and I broke the rules, so you can break the rules, and it goes round and round and round. And and, and in some ways, to me, it, it part of what it gets to is, is the fallacy of the whole idea to begin with, um, right. because there's that sort of sense of like it's always going to be possible to, to claim that, that someone broke the rules first, because at the end of the day, the question has to be – are you more interested in the health of the system that the rules are upholding or are you more interested in winning this fight? Right. Um, and I guess that that are all is my point is that I just I, – I think there is some value to those systems and those ideas of fair fighting. But when those start getting held up as more important than the thing you're fighting for, th- I, that's where I'm often going to have a lot of a problem. Yeah, I, I, totally, totally. Um, and you know that has to do with the kind of – you know. C- Sort of like what you can see, what's right in front of you, compared to what's kind of like down the road, or what the what are the implications? Like the they can see the the systems like right in front of them because they're interacting with them every day, right. right? But the actual effects of any given law, any given fight that they win or lose, you don't really know exactly what those are going to be yet. Particularly when it's something like. A Supreme Court justice, you know, it's yeah. like, yeah, we have a lot of ideas of what course, you know, cases may or may not come and how they may get ruled, yada, yada, yada. We know how a particular justice might vote. But it's like, really, that's like two or three levels of having to see into the future, right? Whereas you can see right now, it's like, oh, you know, the headline is going to be Democrats obstruct blah, 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 you know, or not, Um and and they're literally interacting directly uh, with those rules right at the moment. Right. So, um, you know, it's it's just uh, it, it it's uh, it's short sighted, really. Yeah. It's like they see what's right in front of them, and and then also have you know their reelection campaigns to worry about and all those things. And instead of like you know, I, I do think there's a, a bigger picture, like. Are the rules working right now? Like, 
are you going to be able to hold fast to them and then get anywhere? Yeah, and, and, and to me, this is where, especially in, in terms of the kind of content that we're talking about, this becomes such an interesting question because I guess where I started with this topic and why I wanted to get into it is because this is where I think the trope is the most problematic because I just mm-hmm. – we've talked a lot of it in Iron Fist, but I – um. One of the places, honestly, I see it almost the most is in science fiction, um, you know, like where you often get a race like the Klingons where it's – you know, they're, where they're they're the honorable warrior race, you know. Right, right, right. And, and it's often that there's this incredible romanticization of mm. war, honorable warriors. Um, right. And I guess I just at, – at the, at the end of the day, like that just, that, that just is such a, a contradiction to me because I guess like if you have to fight, sure – you know, I mean – there's some things in terms of like, yeah, you, 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 you fight the other people fighting, you don't kill women and children and, and stuff like that. I, I, I get, but I, I just look at those romanticizations and I just think, you know, not that I think that the people, um, you know, in the Supreme court fight are saying, well, like the Klingons did it. So we should too. Um, but, <laughs> right. but I do think that, that the way in which these stories are contributing to that romanticization of the honorable warrior trope, you know, I think that, that that's something worth exploring because it does have an effect on, on these larger questions. Yeah. And I mean, I, and I do think when, when you're fighting for life and death matters, it's like, you know, just don't, I mean, I guess the idea maybe is like, well, if we lose the fight fighting, not honorably, they're going to do worse things to our people right? or whatever, you know, but, um, but it depends on what things they're already going to do. You know, um, and like, do you trust them? Not if they say, okay, we're going to have a fair fight. And if we win, then this is what's going to happen. You know, and if you win, then this is what's going to happen. Like, do you believe them? Because right. once you lose the fight, right, you often don't have uh, the the strategic position anymore to really wage an effective fight for a long time. So once you lose that fight, now they can just be like, yeah, I, we know what we said, right. but <laughs> you know, and that's, you know, that's the, um, that's sort of the opposite, opposite of the, the Danny Rand, uh, Madam Gao thing, mm-hmm. you know, where like, um, you know, she could have said, okay, we're going to have this fight. And if you lose, we're still going to set the girl free. Right. right. And we're not going to kill your friends. Uh, but we're going to kill you, right? Um, and if you win, then uh, then you're not going to kill us and we'll set the girl free or whatever. So those are basically, you know, uh, but but instead they were saying they were going to do something good if he won and then he won. And they're like, but you didn't really win, right? right? Because you just won this fight that was on paper, basically. It's not, you know, you didn't actually, like real fights tend to be um, for an actual physical advantage, right? Like right. you're trying to take control of a place or you're trying to destroy a weapon or, or whatever. Right. Um, it's not that you win and someone else decides you won in a fair fight. It's just that like the other person's dead or the other person is beaten, you know? Right. Right. And they, happened. they surrender because they know they can no longer win. So there's no point in fighting for it. Um, and if there's some concept of honor and this is what happens after an honorable fight, then like, maybe they get a better outcome than if it was just like, well, it's, we're not going to have any concept of that. You know, I mean, in the, in the ancient world or whatever, right. It was like, when you want to fight, you would destroy the other uh, group basically like outright. That was just the way it was. Um, And now you, you know, it's, I guess it's different, but it's not different, but it's different. No, I think it's true, and I think, and that's we should we should wrap this up. But it, I think it's 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 fitting to go back to that first example you started with. Of, you know, I, I'm sure there's some value to some of these fair fight ideas, and, and I'm not throwing them out entirely. But to me, the questions become in evaluating them: Are, are there people who still think that fighting fair makes like it, it? Are are you the only one still doing this, in, or is right. there some is there still some larger potential to, to that would make this work? Mm-hmm. You know, is there something that's you know. If the idea is that your ego and your sense of your own self worth is going to be hurt by breaking your honor, is there something more at stake? You know that should be more important than that. Right. Um, is you know some people would say my honor is my bond and nothing else matters. Well, okay, that's great, but if a hundred people are going to die because you don't want to give up your honor, I'm I'm not going to look at you very well. Um, right. Right. And and then the last thing is just that idea of who's the one who's deciding what is honorable. 
Um, yes. Because I think that that, um, you know, I, I've always thought this idea, uh, like, you know, that, that assassination of political leaders in warfare is considered to be completely wrong. Um, and, and I get where that's coming from, and I understand it to some extent. But there's also an extent to which what that means is the people who decide that 18-year-old boys who have no real power in the society get to live or die, that those people are safe, but that the 18-year-old boys are the ones we shoot. Um, yeah, that doesn't make yeah. – Yeah, that makes no sense. And, and there's some value to saying like, look, no, the person who gives the order that the army should go and fight, like kill them before you kill the army itself. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, w- once there's a violent struggle, there's a violent struggle, right. and yeah, you like, know, on some level, maybe what you should say is like the whole point of honor is to get us away from the potential for you know that even that it is to have it be just you know, two people fight instead of two million, but if right. it's two million, then just no, end the fight as quick as you can. Um, yeah. Speaking of ending, let's end this podcast as quick as we Very can. Very good. Um, <laughs> bad transition is still a transition. Um, any other last thoughts you wanted to share? Nope. Cool. Okay, that was good then. <laughs> um, well, thanks a lot. I thought this was a, a good discussion and debate. Um, everybody, if you are um, – let us know what you think. Um, are you on the side of the Klingons? Are you on the side of honorable combat? Um, I mean we sort of are too, but what do you? What, what is your perspective? You can tweet at us. You can find us on Facebook, both at Superhero FX. Um, you can also find the, the podcast itself. By searching for Superhero Ethics on Facebook – on um, um, iTunes or Stitcher. Let us know what you think. We would love to hear your feedback. We'd love to um, get your ideas. Give us questions you want us to talk about on a later episode. Um, We'd love to hear it. Um, On behalf of myself, on behalf of Paul, thank you guys so much for taking part, uh, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.